Hi, and welcome back to Adobe Live. My name is Tim, and once again, I'm joining you for another three-day session all about filters. And I couldn't be more excited because this is my favorite thing to do in Photoshop. Besides saving, of course, Hanika. And as always, I am joined by the wonderful people at home in the chat. And if you're not watching on YouTube, no, no, sorry. If you are watching on YouTube, then come on over to Behance. That is um, Behance.net slash Adobe Live. I mean, you can watch on YouTube. That's fine. But the chat is really happening uh, over there. There, there. See? Pointing. I can do that. Uh, right, and let's see who already joined us. In the chat, on Behance, we have Marsha, who says, hey, waking up with espresso, and Tim. Well, that's a way to do it. Hi, Oliver. Hi, Andreas. And... Hi there. Yes, waking up. Oh, I've got to say hi to there as well. Hello, chat. There we are. All right. So, what are we doing today? Well, I wanted to talk to you about filters. In particular, I got a question on the German streams, actually, and they asked me about, hmm, I've been looking through Photoshop. Spoiler, it's going to be about Photoshop. <laughs> and um, I've seen so many different filters for blurring something. Why are there so many? What are they doing? And which one should I pick for which uh, applica um, application, for which uh, image? So that's what we're going to find out today. I will talk to you about all of the blurring filters, apart from one, for a special reason. And I will show you some examples, answer your questions if you have any. Remember, on Behance, please. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, we're going to do that all in about 45 minutes-ish. And then after that, we'll have another stream. But let's, um, oh, hi, Sean. Hello there. Let's grab some music for the background because I've noticed it's awfully quiet. Oh, that's better. All right, cool. Then let's jump right in. Oh, no, hang on. The schedule. Yes, I will just briefly show it because I, mean, I promised Emma to do that. There you go. It's a whole full week. There's me, there's us, and this is the stream right after. Take a screenshot or come back later because I will show it again. Right, okay, let's go into Photoshop. Here we are. Just gotta quit that. I don't think we'll need that anymore. Yeah, sure, save it. Why not? Because otherwise, Annika will be mad. Uh, okay, as always, I have prepared some images, which I've neatly tucked away somewhere. There they are. Okay, brilliant. And hopefully using those images, I will show you some of the important filters and differences. Um, I remember a stream with Tim showing some guy the box filter a while ago. Hmm. Interesting, Sean. Very interesting. <laughs> Hi, Doris. Uh, okay, so let's... Um, where do we start? I suppose we can have a look at this image right here. Because I would like to... Before applying any blur filters, I would like to have a look at something which already is blurred so we can examine what's going on and hopefully get an understanding which filter we should use to achieve an effect similar to this. Right. So we can clearly see we have our main subject in focus, but we, of course, are more interested in the background. And yes, it certainly looks blurry. However, if you have actually a closer look, we can see there are some circles in there and there are definitely some not so blurry lines. But overall, it still looks blurry. So what is happening here. The first um, idea everyone has, and I think the most common filter for blurring, first of all, where, are you, where can you find those filters? Of course, in the filter menu. There are two subgroups. One is called blur. There you go. And one is the blur gallery. 
why they're not together, I'm not so sure, but they are both part of the blurring filters. The first instinct for everyone probably was when they first opened Photoshop, blur, yeah. I want to blur something, so I go to the blur group and then I will blur it. Ah, oh, incredible. But it's only when you click on the blur filter that you realize, did something happen? When it looks the same, especially on a large image, yes, something did happen. But to see that, we actually have to zoom in all the way and find something that's in focus like this here. And then I will apply it again. Can you see the difference? Before and after. Before and after. Well, that's not a lot. So what's actually going on here and why is there a filter called blur and blur more? To see what's going on, I will actually create a new layer. Fill that one with white. And then I will take pencil to draw a single pixel. Of course, for this, I have to make it as small as possible. And we will zoom in right up close until we see one pixel. Okay, there we go. We have one pixel. Because now, if we actually apply the blur filter again, we can see what exactly is happening because we're having a look at one particular instance on an image. And there we are. That's all the filter does. It takes a sample and sort of spreads it out in this cross pattern, just like this. And now I think we can all, um, we can all see why we didn't see too much of a difference here, because it's essentially just blurring on a one pixel radius. Uh, and that's not a lot. So instead, how about create another layer? And we try again with the blur more filter. It ought to blur more, right? According to the manual, it's three to four times stronger than the regular blur filter. All right, let's see what happens. Well, that's sort of underwhelming. <laughs> I guess it's sort of three to four times stronger. But you know, yeah, if I'm going to be honest, I never use it. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's great. It's great to have it. And the reason why it's still there is for legacy reasons. Imagine you have, you have a, um, an action in Photoshop, so something automated, and it's using that filter. Imagine the outcry when that filter would be gone. So that's why it's still there. However, normally, you don't have to use that one. I would just skip past it. And instead, focus on the good uh, filters, on the good parts. Um, so... Let's have a look at the classic Gaussian or Gaussian, because Gauss was a German mathematician, the Gaussian filter, the blur filter that is, which is living right here in the panel. And immediately we can notice a difference. First of all, it's gone, which just happens to be the reason because I, the radius is quite big. But we get a modal dialog where we can actually specify the, um, the radius. And we can see, yeah, sort of looks similar to the first one. That looks awfully similar to uh, this one. But now we can specify how much blurring is happening. And this is, of course, much better, right? We can specify exactly how blurry something should be. And instead of uh, applying this to one pixel, let's see actually how this works on the big image that we have. Let's zoom out. Yeah. I know I can use Command-0. Uh, <laughs> Command-0 to, by the way, look at the entire image to fit it to view. Um, right. So, let's go to the Gaussian blur, Gaussian blur. And we can see, we can sort of get a preview image by clicking here. And we can blur the image. Now, this looks very nice. Obviously, it's blurring, and you sometimes see people just masking out something and blurring the background with a Gaussian uh, blur filter. Named after D. Gauss, which was the guy who, shaked, who used to shake things inside of your old screen in the olden days. 
<lacht> ja, die Gauss. Yeah. Um, okay, but um, as you notice, we don't actually see these lovely, which Sean, I think, already pointed out, bokeh effects. We are missing that. It's all very blurry. And even worse, if we actually go to another image, where it will become even more obvious, which will be this one, if we, for example, select um, something, like select subject, and then just gonna invert the selection and try to blur the background, which doesn't make too much sense since it's already blurred, but I'm just go with it for a moment. So then blur, Gaussian blur. We sometimes even see these weird halo effects. Can you see that? This green here. It sort of blurs outwards. Those are the two things we try to avoid. You're too young, Sandrine. Uh, Tim, says Sandrine. I'm too young for degaussing CRT monitors. Excuse me. I happen to have one. Well, not anymore, but when I was younger. I remember the sound. Boom. And when you put a magnet next to it, it had all funky patterns. I'm not that young. But thank you. <laughs> uh, okay. So, we can see we have this sort of halo effect around our selection, which we don't want. Why is that happening? Because even though we have selected the... Um, background like this, it's still sampling from inside um, of, oh, rather outside of that selection, and that's why we get that. So, can we fix that both issues, so both uh, the missing bokeh and also the um, halo effect? Yes, we can fix them both. The good thing about that is because we happen to have more filters than just the Gaussian one. Um, for this, I will, oh, we can select the subject if we want, using the new object selection tool. And for this, go over to the uh, filter, blur, lens blur. This one actually has a physical model of a real lens, or at least a simulation of a real lens, and it's also much smarter about um, taking uh, something outside versus inside of a selection. So, in this case, we can go ahead and use our lens blur. Layer mask. Nope. Transparency. There we go. And then we can set our focal distance. However, since this one is already pretty blurred, I suppose we can use a different one to see what's actually going on because I quite like to show the bokeh effect. For this, I, I have prepared um, this cityscape, which is very lovely, and it has a lot of lights. So, let's see if we can add some lens blur to that. Going to the blur filter, Lens Blur, and immediately, after some render time, this takes some time, we can see something is definitely happening. Just going to adjust the radius, bring that all the way down, and after it's done rendering, we can see, ah yes, look at that. We have our circles right there. So what's happening here? Photoshop is now applying a uh, special way of blurring, which is more similar to what's actually happening in, re in the real world. Um, and it's using some information which we can specify over on the right. For example, we can specify the shape of the aperture. Let's say we want only square one. Doesn't really happen in real life, but we can do it. And immediately we can see, yes, that's definitely a square right here, for example. We can also Make, them, make it more round. If we prefer fully round uh, shapes, we can just increase the shape curvature and immediately they are round. We can specify how um, and where it should be focused, either by say, going via a slider to uh, go to the distance, like this. Uh, this, is, uh, this becomes important in just a moment. And, of course, we can also specify how much blur we want. From very little, 
to quite a lot. And this again takes a second to render. The bigger your image, the longer it will take. Furthermore, we can apply our fake specular highlights, or as Oliver calls it, foke. That sounds weird. Um, okay. The way this section of the filter works is first, you can set how bright you actually want them. So from very bright, I think that's a bit too much, to not so bright. And you can also specify how much bokeh you want. So do you only want uh, these effects applied to the very, very brightest, the, 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 the most shining lights in your scene? Or do you also want some darker objects to produce uh, these specular highlights? In this case, I think we can limit it to only the highest bits. So it, uh, in other words, the, um, the brightness of a pixel has to be brighter than this threshold. If it's darker, it won't get specular highlights. That's what's happening. And now, if we increase that again, we should see fewer highlights. And if we increase it even more, they should disappear altogether. There you go. Right, I think that's a bit too much. <laughs> so let's just bring that down even further. There we are. You will also notice, if I actually bring them back up again, they are quite... Um, yeah, they're just white highlights. If you um, if you don't like that, you can also bring in some color in a different filter, not this one. So we will actually see what's um, going on there in a moment. Okay, so I th I reckon about here. Yeah, that's fine. You can also uh, apply some noise. So because we are blurring something, we are often losing the original grain of the image. And if we want to have that back, you can see I already applied a 2% uh, or pixel. Percent, yes. Uh, I already, already applied a 2% amount of noise. And we can actually see that here a bit. If we actually zoom in. Just have to let that render for just a moment. To do. This is a big image, by the way. That's why it's taking a bit longer. If I set this to more accurate, it will take even longer. So, yeah, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but if we can, uh, if we set the amount to a higher value, you will introduce more grain, more noise. However, I think this is already quite enough. We can see there's some beautiful grain in here because if you set it too high, then uh, you will get quite a grainy image, and I don't really. I don't want that. More often than not, I will... Yeah, there you go. <laughs> that's that's awful. More often than not, I will actually set this to zero um, because I can al always add grain in Photoshop. I don't need to do it here. Okay. So we can now click on OK. And we have our blurred image. Brilliant. Okay. Now, let's go ahead and have a look at the other bokeh filter, which I've talk about briefly just a second ago. For this, let's go over to the Blur Gallery. In there, we have a whole host of different filters, and they all belong sort of to the same group. That's where probably they are in the Blur Gallery. Can you add glow here? Definitely yes. <laughs> let's start with the Tilt Shift filter. This one, instead of blurring the whole image, only blurs part of the image. And we can specify that range by dragging it up and down. Let's say I only want the foreground to be in focus. I can bring it down and defined by the two lines are the limits of where the blurring starts, which is this uh, solid line, and where it ends. We can also rotate them if we want. And I think this one is just fine. How about this? Again, we can specify how much it should be blurred, either by clicking and dragging on the dial here, we can already see, that's very nice, or by using the sliders um, up here. We can also specify a uh, distortion. This is something which happens with um, uh, tilt shifting. You can sort of get um, distortion that goes in sort of this direction. We will see that hopefully um, at the end of the stream. I will show you another way to use this filter. But for now, I think we are fine. And as promised, 
we can bring some bokeh. This time the threshold is a slider like this and sort of looks the same, but now, as I said, we can bring in some color. There we are. And set it to wherever we want. Perhaps reduce it a bit. Yeah, right about here. I don't know. <laughs> Fine. Okay. Oh, the fun we had with the tilt shift, so we could turn everything like a scene from a railway model. Yeah, that's uh, from a railway model. Yeah, definitely. If you have um, aerial shots of something, you can turn it into like a very small scene. All right. There are more um, filters that are part of this one. Um, but before we have a look at them, I wanted to go back and have a look at another one because actually i needed that image oh well uh, let's open it again there are two oh there's there's one issue with uh, blur filters let's say we have well, i guess we can have a look at a different image we've already seen that one and i have prepared other ones would be a shame if we don't see them. Um, sometimes, if you zoom into an image, you can see the skin perhaps is, uh, it has a lot of texture. And maybe, or not even skin, it could be something else, maybe you want to smooth that out just a bit. Using the blur filter for this certainly works. Gaussian, Gaussian blur, there you go. It's, it's now smooth. But also, of course, we lost a lot of detail like the edges suddenly become very soft. Maybe that's not something we want. So can we somehow apply a, a, a blur to the filter, but retain some of the um, details, which otherwise we would lose? Yes, yes we can. For this, we can have a look at two filters which are very similar, but have one key difference. The first one, is the smart blur and the second one is the surface blur but let's start with the smart blur in here we can not only apply a blur radius but suddenly we have something called a threshold and for the smart blur the threshold uh, determines how how different uh, pixels uh, must be before they are affected by the blur so in other words, let's just apply it, and I think that makes it more obvious. I will now take this, and using the um, radius ladder, I can increase or decrease. Did you notice? Nothing's happening. The reason for that is we haven't specified the, um, the, the, the threshold. If we bring that actually up, we should see in our window... Can I make this bigger? No. Thanks, Photoshop. Let's zoom in in that case. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Let's see if we can actually have a look at something with some texture. Eyes usually are a good point to start. There we are. All right. Okay. <laughs> Come on. Here we are. All right. So, if I decrease the threshold, like I said, you can see... Nothing is happening. But as soon as I increase it slowly, we realize some details are starting to go away. But sharp edges, like the hair, that's still, um, yeah, it's still there. And as soon as we have a sufficiently large enough threshold, we can also increase the blur radius, which yeah, it's just like, like the Gaussian blur. It defines how big uh, the blur mount is. Of course, right now the threshold, obviously, way too high, clearly. So, let's bring that down. To right about here, maybe. And let's also bring down the radius. 
to about there. So we have, if I click, you can see we have blurred out some parts, but most of our detail is still there. To actually see, to actually see what's uh, the difference between this smart blur versus the surface blur, I will go back and increase everything so we can actually see what's going on. So right about here, so we can see what's happening. Clicking OK, we'll then apply the filter. This takes a moment. Mm -mm -mm. Legacy pop-up windows will always be small. <laughs> Things are small. Yeah. Uh, I guess that's the reason why. Okay. Actually, I will undo that. Copy. And apply the same filter again. By the way, if you also want to change options of that filter, so I can apply the same filter again by just going here. But if I want to set the options again, I can hold down the option button and then it will actually bring up the filter. And then I can apply it again. Or I can just apply it again if I don't want to make any changes. Looks like a painting now. Interesting, right? Um, yeah, of course, I overdid that effect just to demonstrate how this would look. Hopefully that's uh, that's obvious. All right, so this was the first one, the smart blur. There's also something called the surface blur. Looks very similar, and this actually does preview. We have a lovely preview box. Uh, doesn't get any bit bigger though. Um, so yeah, let's zoom in. Why not? There we go. Very similar. Right, we still have a radius, and this one behaves exactly the same. Nothing is happening unless you actually increase the threshold. But notice how this one behaves different uh, from the other one. We actually get a very smooth overlay of some sort. Um, so it's not as painterly, maybe, I don't know. It's very airbrushed but the original image is still showing through. We can still clearly see that there's uh, the original texture in there. Can you see that? So it doesn't matter how much we try to blur it, the original image is still showing through. And this can be useful. Let's see if I increase the threshold, it gets more blurred. Of course, I don't want that. Just one a bit. And Again, the threshold uh, decides how dissimilar or how different um, the pixels have to be before they get applied. And I think I reckon right about here will show the difference very nicely. We can see the shirt suddenly very, um, very smooth. But even though we have a lot of blur in there, we can see like the transition from the shirt to the hand still very sharp. Okay, now let's have a look at the difference. Oh, no, no, not like that. Let's have a look at the difference between the two filters. Remember, they both try to preserve detail, but they don't look quite the same. So I, th I reckon we can have a look at the face. And I think now you will start to notice smart blur, surface blur. We can go even closer if we want. Smart Blur and Surface Blur. So two similar effects but with very different results. Okay, hopefully that will help you to decide which one you like. I, I reckon for this, for skin, I like this one a bit more. Of course, we can go back and um, fade that filter a bit. We can use layer mask, we can use smart filters if we don't want to apply it to the eyes. For example. Okay. Cool. Now, since we only have 15 minutes left, let's have a quick look at some of the other ones because there are some really cool ones in there, such as. And for this, I will use this lovely image. I want to create some sort of motion trail behind this person, just coming out like this, you know? How could we do that? First of all, I'm going to um, select this person by just clicking on it, on him. 
And then Photoshop will think very hard. And it should select the person. There we are. Just took a moment. And duplicate that to put a new layer. Duplicate that actually again because I want to blur one of these um, uh, uh, layers. And now, going back, of course, to our blur group, we have something called motion blur. In here, you can see, whoop, we can set an angle. For this, I suppose we can use about something like this. And the distance, which now starts to mimic what would happen if this person actually moved in front of the camera. And I think we can go all the way. Well, maybe not all the way. Yeah, I reckon about there. Of course, we realize for it to be a motion trail, it has to be behind the person. Luckily, since it's on a separate layer, we can just use the move tool and just bring that back where it's supposed to be. Right around here, I reckon. And if we duplicate that, we can make it even brighter. We can then merge these two and perhaps use transform tools using the grid to sort of shape this the way we want. Maybe add a curve like this. Something like that. And there we are. Bring that back to shoe. Yes. Good enough. <laughs> okay. Um, and there we are. Now we have added this sort of motion trail behind that. But I think we can all agree this was um, not as easy as, as it could be. You know, we have to transform it. We can't really specify the shape that easily. We have to duplicate that. So perhaps instead of doing it this way, let's go back to our friend the Blur Gallery and let's have a look at the Path Blur. In here, we instead of having like a very small angle we can set, we can now actually set the path of our blur. Of course, we need to increase the speed. There we go. Whack. And here. Even more, please. Thank you. And also... We uh, should set it instead of um, having a centered blur there. We should set this to a non-centered blur because now the blur will actually start at our point and then go outwards. That's what we want. However, why did I pick the path blur? Because now we can actually set a curve, something which we couldn't do before. And even better, well, that's cool, we can, we can actually set a second path, if we want, which not only has to be one point, if I arrow like this, we can also set lots of different paths, like that. Can make it really, really crazy, like this. This, of course, will now take a second to render. There we are. Oh, ah, yeah, that's, that's not too bad, eh? Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm actually, I think we can keep it like that. That's not too bad. We can also add a taper to the end, something which I don't want for this because it's already shrinking, right? Um, and there's something which I want to just draw your attention to, high quality. Yeah. Sure, why not? We probably won't see a too much of a difference since uh, we're not zoomed in all the way, but if you look at 100%, then you can see a difference. Click OK. Photoshop will take a second to render. Meanwhile, I will use this opportunity to drink some water, in case you didn't know. Joe says, never used path blur before. Looks great. I know. That's why I like it so much. And that's why I always, I don't want to say I, I cringe, but I'm thinking to myself when someone's using the motion blur filter, I'm thinking, you do not have a better one. It's, like, it's right there. 
That is. Oh, well. Okay. Now, since I've checked the high quality checkbox, it does take a hot minute or second, depending on how fast your computer is. But we will wait that out because it's worth it. And there we are. Isn't that lovely? We can actually see the blur is sort of overlapping on itself and it's all good. Oh, that's great. I like it. Okay. Now, I also, speaking of the blurs right there, there is another one which people often use. This one is called the, uh, hang on, blur, radial blur. And people often use it, for example, to make a car tire spin, to look like they are spinning. And, um, oh, Joe asks, is there an After Effects equivalent to Path Blur? That's a very good question. I, um, I, I don't think so. No, I'm, I don't think so. You can sort of fake it, I suppose. But I don't, I don't think there's a specific one like this. Not that I know. Um, okay, so uh, back to this one. People often fake the spinning of... Actually, um, this is a bad image to demonstrate. <laughs> Let's go to something where we can actually see it. Going back to this, maybe. Uh, filter, blur, uh, 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 radial blur. There we go, have it. And we should see... I reckon about right here... First of all, we don't get a preview. That's not great. Yeah, I suppose, I guess that's sort of working. But you saw we couldn't really specify where this was going on. It's, like Sean said, a very old filter. You can see we don't get a preview. So while this one does have the cool feature that we can also zoom if we want, which is very unique, I do want to show you the other spin filter, which is, of course, in our blur gallery, spin blur. And here we can see, we can actually specify how blurry something should be. And I should be able to also zoom this one. There we are. Just on the screen, it's sometimes tricky to actually find this and now we can also see what's actually going on, not all the way if we want. And if you apply this to um, some tires maybe on a car, if they are at a perspective, of course, you can also make this a bit smaller. You can also set the um, gradient of how much it should be affected like this. Then you can actually really dial that in and see which um, effect should sit where and how it's affecting the image. Probably something like this, which of course doesn't make any sense since this car, yeah, is way in the background. Right, okay. One last thing and then I suppose we're done already because the next stream is already uh, coming up very soon. In about 10, no, 20 minutes. I would like to enhance the blur of this image. The background is already blurred, but it's not quite blurred enough. However, for this to work, I need to tell Photoshop which part of the image should be blurred in which part shouldn't be. I could, of course, create a mask manually and say, oh, yes, this one should be 10% blurred, this one should be in focus, here we should have about 50%, and right there we should have 100%. This is called a depth mask. But maybe, just maybe, Photoshop, Photoshop has an automated way of creating such a mask for us. And of course, if I say it like this, you do know the answer is yes, Photoshop does. And this one is actually hidden, sort of, in the neural filters. Because as we can see, we have, where is it? 
Death Blur. There we go. It's a beta filter. How interesting. Can enable that. It will take a moment to render. We are, however, not actually interested in anything that's coming up here because there's a checkbox. As soon as um, it's done rendering, I probably should have picked a smaller image. There we are. I'm actually interested in this checkbox here. Output depth map, map only. Yes, please. And immediately we can see Photoshop has generated based on artificial intelligence, Adobe Sensei. Yes. Uh, which part of the image is in the foreground? In this case, the car. Which one is in the midground? The person and the background is in white. Okay. We can use this one, and if we select all, thinking back to our other crash course all about masks, you hopefully remember that you can paste selections like this. If you don't know what I just did, go back, watch the other one. I don't have time to explain. <laughs> There's no time to explain. Um, okay, and now, since we have loaded this as a layer mask, we can go back to our good friend, the lens blur, load this selection as a layer mask, this depth mask as a layer mask, and now if I increase the, hello, increase the radius, hopefully we can now specify which part should be in focus. It will just take a moment. There we are. For example, we only want this part to be in focus. The mirror, then the dog mask should become more blurry. Yes, it does. Or the background. And of course, keep in mind, it can't magically remove the blur. It can just enhance it. Now we have blurred the foreground. In this case, of course, we want to have this mask, uh, where well, your mask, uh, in focus. So now we have, as you can see, enhanced the blur. And if you can imagine that original, originally the background was in focus, then this will, effect would be even more dramatic. But I thought this image is so good, I have to use it, even though the background is already a bit more blurred than I would like it to be. Could you add, sharp, add a sharp image to the background and match the blur? Um, of course, I could just um, mask out the car, add an, a different background, and hopefully Photoshop will still realize that um, uh, it's one image and then create our depth mask. So, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, all right. Of course, we have to disable the layer mask. And there we have it. Brilliant. All right. Actually, we do have time for one more thing. Do we? Hang on, let's see. Yeah, I think we have time for one more. All right, for this one we will actually, oh, no, no, not emojis, please, thank you. <laughs> I will actually use a, um, a blank image. So just, uh, yep, custom, that's fine. Let's um, invert that, use some text. And we shall call it text, because I'm very clever like that, and I'm sure I've added a typo in there. Yeah, text are. Or instead of text, we can use the thing Marsha just said. Thanks. There we are. There we actually, is there a... Uh, more bold version of this font. No. Okay. And we shall fake it. Just gonna duplicate that. And use the move tool. Don't tell anyone. There we are. <laughs> now it's thick. <laughs> okay. Um I would like to apply a um blur to this text, but only to some parts of this. Text-tastic. Well, thank you, Sean. Um, and for this, I will actually go back to our blur gallery, sorry, blur gallery, and we're using the uh, tilt shift. We can also try the field blur, which can also be fun. 
because using the field blur, we can specify that something should only be blurred like this. But I actually want to use the um, tilt shift because I promised you to talk about the distortion, which of course I should keep that promise. So we're just gonna blur that over large. And now we can hopefully, if we can see the render difference, so no distortion, lots of distortion, but it sort of blooms out. If you want to say it like that. Okay, so a bit of distortion, yeah, sure. There we are. Very nice, but what I want to um, show you, or what I want to do, is I want to apply an adjustment layer <coughs> to this text. Because fun doesn't have to stop here. If we, for example, now use an adjustment layer like the uh, gradient map, maybe. And if we were to go in here and then add some color to that adjustment map, like this, maybe for cyan, and bring that here, and maybe add some darker blue tones, like that, and perhaps, no, oh, that also looks cool, but not what I want. Maybe some very warm highlights, just a hint. And suddenly we can create some really cool effects. Make it a bit brighter. And the reason why I'm showing this is because I just wanted to, to, you to see that if I had applied this as a smart filter, which of course I forgot, doesn't matter. We can just recreate that. So, e -e -e -e. can I just group them together or do I have to? Yeah, fine. I shall group them. Then convert it to a smart object. Fine. Luckily, I can just apply the same filter again. Yes. And apply our gradient map. One more time. Like this. Like that. Teal. And yellow. Ooh. Orange, rather. There we go. And now, what I want to show you, if we go back to the Blur Gallery, this will update live, as you can see. Whoosh. If, we, if we blur that even more all the way, it will sort of disappear. And then imagine having a transition like whoosh. Isn't that nice? Bring down the distortion if we want. See the difference? Lots of distortion. Brilliant. And I think this could be just a very interesting way of using the um, tilt shift filter in a way perhaps you haven't used it before, hopefully. And with that, I think that's all the time we have. Thank you for watching. I will be back tomorrow with a... Um, with another stream, and this one will be all about sharpening. So today we have blurred a lot of things, tomorrow we will sharpen them back up. So do join me, and of course do join us for the next stream, coming up in a minute or so, actually in 10 minutes, uh, which is the journey through Japan with Tig Rice and Joe Allen. They will uh, have a look at geisha portraits today, so stick around, and otherwise see you either in a minute or tomorrow. Bye for now.